Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a briefing today about natural climate solutions, a win-win solution for our environment and economy. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Next slide, please. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customer. Next slide, please. Our session today is the result of a new collaboration between EESI and U.S. Nature for Climate. U.S. Nature for Climate is a coalition of nine conservation, environmental, and sustainable business organizations that work to ensure our forests, farms, ranches, grasslands, and wetlands are part of our overall strategy to combat climate change. I hope you'll take a moment to visit them online at www.usnatureforclimate.org. When I say four, it's the number four. So US Nature, the number four, climate.org. And learn about the science underpinning their work and read about natural solutions in action across the country that are helping avoid greenhouse gas emissions and enhance carbon sequestration in forests, wetlands, grasslands, and agricultural lands. Thanks very much to our new friends at US Nature for Climate for the opportunity to work together today. We'll be joined in just a moment by four panelists who will help us understand the potential for natural climate solutions to help mitigate climate change and deliver new economic opportunities with lasting benefits for rural and urban communities. I will leave it to them to explain what natural climate solutions are, but I wanted to share some context from our perspective at ESI about how this fits into our congressional education programming. We recognize that climate change is a global problem that requires an urgent mobilization of every available tool at our disposal from every corner of the economy. Sure, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and new ways of moving goods and providing services will deliver a lot of emissions reductions, but not all of the emissions reductions we need, and not necessarily the ability to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Carbon-free building and transportation technology will lead to many, many new jobs, but we need our entire workforce to evolve in an equitable way to meet the needs of a decarbonized clean energy economy and that includes opportunities in rural areas, forested areas, and agricultural areas. So when we discussed COP emitting sectors during our Congressional Climate Camp series, we were sure to include agriculture. And just last Friday, when we highlighted four climate mitigation adaptation win-wins, we featured agriculture and mass timber. And if you read our report on coastal resilience, a coastal future for coastal community, a resilient future for coastal communities, excuse me, we covered nature-based solutions extensively as solutions with merit on their own right, as well as alternatives to seawalls, bulkheads, and the like that can do more harm than good in the long run. We have to consider every source of potential climate mitigation and adaptation, and that is how our discussion today fits into our program. As a reminder right from the start, if you miss anything today, or you would like to revisit the presentations later, everything, including an archive of the webcast and presentation materials we are allowed to post, will be available online at www.esi.org. And while you're there, I hope you'll take a moment and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. One last bit of logistics. We will have some time after our panel presentations for discussions. We have a very large audience joining us today. If you have a question, you have two options to ask it. You can send us a message on Twitter at EESI online, or you can send us an email to EESI at EESI.org. We will do our best to incorporate questions from our online audience into the discussion. And now it's my privilege to introduce our panel. Our first speaker is Catherine McDonald. Catherine is the North America Natural Climate Solutions Director for the Nature Conservancy. Catherine leads NCS's work in the US and Canada to protect uh, carbon and increase sequestration in natural and working lands. Catherine currently serves as Vice Chair of the Oregon Global Warming Commission and is a member of the Carbon Policy Office's Natural and Working Lands Workgroup and the Oregon Department of Forestry's Forest Carbon Policy Stakeholder Workgroup. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? I'm really pleased to be here uh, to be able to uh, talk to you today about the important role of natural climate solutions as a critical part of our uh, climate mitigation strategy here in the US. Uh, next slide. Today, what I'm going to do is kind of set the foundation for the other panelists by um, giving you some kind of basic description of what natural climate solutions are, 
uh, talking about the economic benefits of uh, investments in natural cl climate solutions at a, a kind of broad level, uh, and then um, talk to you about the important role of the federal government in helping to accelerate adoption of natural climate solutions. And then following me, um, we'll get more details uh, on the specific kinds of economic benefits from the rest of our panelists. Next slide, please. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is, uh, works towards creating a world where people and nature thrive. And uh, as I'm sure you all know that are uh, listening in today, that uh, climate change poses an incredible risk uh, to both of these uh, outcomes, uh, to people and to nature. On the nature side, we're seeing incredible rain shifts uh, for species. We're seeing an increase in extinctions, and we're seeing whole ecosystems uh, start to turn over. Uh, and and uh, all of those things have uh, an incredible impact on um, the mm -hmm. kinds of goods and services that nature provides to people. And then directly, direct impacts to people, uh, the, the kinds of things that are happening as a result of climate change and global warming are uh, having incredible impacts to our health, uh, the economy and to our infrastructure. Next slide, please. And while it's critical uh, to reduce emissions from other sectors, uh, as Dan mentioned, we cannot get to one day within 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, increase in temperature without nature. The two uh, reports that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, presented a few years ago, made it clear that nature needs to be part of the solution. Colleagues of mine at the Nature Conservancy worked in collaboration with many other researchers uh, to look at the global potential of natural climate solutions. And uh, in that research uh, determined that, uh, um, that natural and working land strategies or natural climate solutions could be as much of a third of what was needed to achieve the um, Paris commitments, uh, the 2015 Paris commitments. So it, it can play a huge role and um, has many co-benefits, which I'll touch on in a bit. Next slide, please. Uh, the other important point that IPCC made in those reports is we have uh, very little time to make a big difference in uh, how uh, we address this issue. And while these teenagers are smiling for the camera, uh, their t-shirts tell a very uh, somber note about the importance of us acting quickly to reduce emissions and increase sequestration in the land sector uh, because of the impacts it's going to have for future generations, uh, current and future generations, especially the, our youth. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna take you back to your um, biology 101 class and just a quick reminder uh, about uh, the, the foundation of natural climate solutions. And as you'll recall, plants uh, are able to take uh, the water uh, that they um, take in from their roots and the carbon dioxide they're able to absorb from the atmosphere through their leaves and they form uh, glucose uh, and oxygen through a process called photosynthesis. So that uh, glucose gets um, incorporated into their plant materials. Uh, it creates uh, um, and then into the soil uh, through their roots, but also as plant materials, leaves and uh, then things fall to the, to the forest floor and, and in, in our agricultural land. So uh, Carbon is stored both in plant materials and in our soils. Uh, both are very important um, uh, sinks, uh, carbon sinks. Next slide, please. So the, um, you, we can take uh, three broad kinds of actions that can influence how much carbon dioxide is taken up by plants and stored in their tissues and in, their, uh, in, the, in the soils and that those three are protecting the ecosystems, intact ecosystems we have today, where we already have significant carbon stores, 
restoring ecosystems where uh, we can build back carbon stores to those, uh, to those ecosystems, and then improving how we manage working lands, uh, whether those be agricultural lands or forests um, or grasslands and rangelands. Uh, and those changes in management practices uh, can make a big difference uh, to the amount of carbon that's stored. Next slide, please. The land sector in the US is already reducing our overall emissions by 12% based on the most recent uh, EPA inventory data. And um, research that another colleague of mine uh, led um, looked at the potential to increase uh, the amount that the land sector could store uh, through 21 different management practices. Uh, there's a lot on this slide, so I'll spend just a few minutes describing um, what you can see here. The length of the bar uh, is the total potential that could be achieved um, through the kinds of actions such as reforestation, cover crops, um, and the like. Uh, we also looked at uh, how much could be accomplished at different price points, at $10 a ton, $50 a ton, and $100 a ton. And uh, so the, the color, uh, the length of the portion of the colored bar shows you what's, what's possible um, at different price points. And then we looked at the different pathways to identify the kinds of co-benefits that you also get by changing management practices and protecting habitats uh, and restoring habitats. And those are shown in the um, bar, colored bars on the left side of the axis. So there are significant benefits to air quality, to water quality, to biodiversity. Um, and, uh, and so those are all uh, secondary benefits that we can get through these changes in management practices. In order to achieve this potential, though, we need to dramatically scale adoption of practices that are climate smart. Next slide, please. So now just to shift uh, briefly to talk about uh, the economic, some of the economic benefits. Um, there are already an estimated uh, over 220,000 jobs in the US focused on forest and wetland restoration projects alone. Uh, so that's a significant portion of the workforce. And for every million dollars we increase in, in investments in reforestation and sustainable forest management, we can support nearly 40 additional jobs, so significant jobs. And uh, forest and wetland restoration projects typically keep more of the funding that's invested locally. So there's significant be benefits to the local communities uh, around where these projects are happening. Next slide, please. In addition to the potential benefits in rural parts of, the, of America, there are also significant and important benefits uh, in urban areas. Uh, recent research that another colleague at the Nature Conservancy led has demonstrated the inequities in forest canopy in urban areas uh, across America. The over 90% of urban areas have much higher uh, canopy cover in uh, higher income neighborhoods than lower income neighborhoods and, and um, neighborhoods um, that uh, are dominated by, um, by communities of color. And that creates a host of challenges um, uh, so in addition to creating new jobs uh, in urban areas by, re by planting trees, we also can reduce energy costs. Uh, we can uh, reduce uh, health uh, impacts that are currently occurring in those neighborhoods because of the lower um, uh, forest canopy around respiratory decision conditions and heat-related illnesses. And as we've all found out uh, over the last year, uh, being out in nature really improves our mental health and has been a significant, uh, I think, um, help to those, uh, to all of us uh, during the, these times of being uh, pretty confined. Next slide, please. In addition to the benefits uh, for jobs and, and benefits uh, in, uh, in equity in urban areas, 
Uh, there are significant benefits to producers, uh, to farmers and forest landowners. Uh, recent research by the Soil Health Institute demonstrated that uh, in implementing soil health management practices can increase net income for farmers. Uh, they focused this research in the Midwest and showed that you could increase um, uh, uh, net revenue uh, to farmers by $52 per acre in areas dominated by corn and $45 an acre in areas um, where uh, being grown for soybeans. In addition, uh, adding trees to row crops provides uh, a greater income stability on farms and that will result in economic resilience to those farms. And there is some significant work being led by uh, the Savannah Institute and others that is looking at how to, to bring uh, row crop farmers and tree crop farm farmers together um, to, to do just that. Uh, and then on the forest side, um, we can not only increase uh, the amount of uh, carbon that is taken up and stored on our forests, uh, that uh, doing that can increase revenues to family forest landowners. So there are significant benefits to uh, forest landowners as well. Next slide, please. And then uh, we get uh, many goods and services from nature. And so uh, there are economic benefits to taxpayers from uh, protecting and restoring nature. Uh, coastal wetlands provide storm protection valued at over $23 billion a year in the US. And um, green storm water infrastructure is usually has a lower capital investment cost and gray uh, infrastructure. So there's another uh, benefit to taxpayers and uh, also to utility uh, bills by uh, maintaining uh, forest cover in uh, watersheds uh, for every, um, we can reduce treatment costs by 20% for every 10% increase in forest cover. So many benefits to taxpayers and to utility payers. Next slide. And while the um, while the uh, there are lots of economic benefits, uh, it as I mentioned earlier, it's really critical that we scale up uh, the adoption of these kinds of practices. And there are a number of um, things that the federal government can do to uh, help make that happen, including uh, providing technical assistance to landowners uh, so they uh, have the right information and know how to go about changing practices, providing financial incentives for natural climate solutions. While there are direct benefits to producers, uh, there are sometimes transition costs that uh, make it such that having incentives to, to change practices are really important. Uh, there are also some really important investments in our federal lands and, and in state lands that uh, uh, the federal government should be um, advancing. And then uh, there are ways that um, the federal government can help scale voluntary carbon markets. There is significant interest in corporations uh, who are trying to meet sustainability goals to, uh, to in addition to looking at how to reduce their own footprint to scale um, to, to enhance their contribution through uh, acquisition of voluntary offsets. And there are ways that the federal government can help uh, scale the um, engagement in carbon markets. And then there are ways that um, the federal government can incentivize smart growth uh, uh, activities of state and local governments. And then finally, certainly uh, lots of opportunity to invest in workforce development programs that target forestry and ecological rest restoration. So with that, I will turn it over to my panelists to um, tell us a little more. You can go to the next slide. Uh, also happy to uh, get any follow-up uh, from folks on any of the information I provided. Thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine. That was a great presentation. Um, thank you very much for getting us um, um, getting us off to a great start. Uh, I'm going to move along to our second panelist. But before I do, 
Um, there was a lot of great information in Catherine's presentation. If you missed any of it, um, if you want to go back and watch it again, or if you want to view her presentation materials, just as a reminder, everything will be posted online at www.eesi.org. Um, and also, if you have any questions for Catherine or for the other three panelists who are about to speak, there are two ways you can ask your question. Uh, you can send us um, an email, eesi at eesi.org, or you can follow us on Twitter and send in a message that way. Uh, and our Twitter handle is at eesi online. Our second panelist is Chris Reynolds. Chris is a fifth generation corn and soybean farmer in Nokomis, Illinois. Uh, he began his soil health journey in 2013 by incorporating cover crops, no-till, nutrient management practices into his farming operation. And he continues to expand and improve their use on his farm each year. He joined American Farmland Trust in 2017, and his primary responsibility is managing programs in the Midwest that promote sound farming practices, help keep farmers on the land, and protect farmland. Chris is a certified crop advisor with the American Society of Agronomy uh, and holds a specialty certification as a 4R nutrient management specialist and sustainability specialist. Chris, welcome to the panel today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm the currently serve as the Midwest Regional Director for American Farmland Trust and also a fifth generation steward of the land on a corn and soybean farm here in central Illinois. And the farm that I uh, that I'm on today is a lot different than the farm that I grew up on. Um, you know, my grandfathers both farmed, uh, both came from farm families from both sides of the farm. And, you know, they, they typically had a much um, longer crop rotation with four to five different crops in that rotation. And also livestock was really a vital component uh, to that farming operation uh, during those times as well. And so I wanna to talk to you a little bit today about how agricultural lands and the, and the conservation practices that are currently being adopted on the land um, are a natural climate solution. Next slide, please. So agriculture and conservation um, have always been a, a huge part of my life and, and, and why I was really drawn to come to work for AFT over four years ago. Uh, American Farmland Trust is a national nonprofit organization um, whose mission is to protect farm and ranch land and promote sound farming practices and keep farmers on the land. Uh, the photo on the left there is my, my grandfather um, back in the early 1970s um, next to the uh, Case 930 tractor that's still on the, on the farm today being used. Um, he used that for a lot of different things back then from planting to cultivating um, and, and definitely has some different uses on the farm today because of its size and, and the technologically, technological advances that we've, that we've made in agriculture since, since that time. Uh, the photo there in the middle is my, is my youngest son um, back uh, in a soybean field several years ago. Um, this was one of the first fields that I no-tilled um, into a green cereal rye cover crop. And, and the success from that first year has, has led me to where I am today in, in adopting more cover crops and, and continuing um, in my soil health journey. Um, the, the photo there on the right, the, the st STAR program, Saving Tomorrow's Agriculture Resources, is a program that we've worked with extensively here in, here in Illinois. Uh, it's given me the ability to assess the individual fields on my farm by the practices that I'm adopting, and also challenges me to want to do better by the land and adopt new practices. Next slide. So I want to first talk about the role of soils, and, and we know that small changes to the soil organic carbon pool can have major impacts on, on the global carbon budget. And, and since the advent of modern agriculture, we've lost more than half of the organic carbon that was originally stored in U.S. soils. And the soil organic carbon pool um, can be up to four times the amount of carbon stored in the vegetation on the land. And rebuilding carbon stocks in agriculture soils is not only crucial for the continued productivity of our nation's farmers, but necessary to combat the impacts of climate change. Next slide, please. So to, despite the recent uptick in soil health practice adoption, um, fewer than a third of the 260 million acres in row crops are managed with no-till or strip-till and less than 5% of those acres are using cover crops according to the 2017 Census of Agriculture. 
By increasing the use of just these two practices, American farmers have an unparalleled opportunity to combat climate change, improve water quality, and build on-farm resilience and profitability. Some of the many co-benefits of, of these practices include soil temperature and moisture regulation, winter and early seed season weed suppression. We can improve the soil structure. We can reduce soil loss from wind and water erosion while also increasing the diversity of soil biological communities and capture more nutrients and make them more available for, for growing crops. Next slide, please. So what I'm seeing on my farm and hearing from other farmers that we work with is, is climate change is having a significant impact. We are seeing fewer favorable planting days in the spring. Um, that's mainly due to more intense and frequent rainfall events. Farmers are noticing that um, erosion is taking place in areas where they've never seen it before. Um, they're finding it more difficult to manage weeds because of, because of the increased rainfall events. Um, this has made it more important than ever in my, in my mind to adopt soil health practices and to manage our farms for, for soil health. But at the same time, it's making it more challenging for farmers. You know, cover crops require an additional level of management. Um, they have to be planted in the summer or the fall when, when harvest activities are, are really the main priority for farmers. Uh, when I began my soil health journey back in 2013, I, I started with incorporating cover crops into existing no-till fields. I wanted to further reduce erosion, um, help suppress weeds, and also uh, reduce chemical costs that were associated with that weed control. And, and really since that time, you know, I've seen improvements in the soil that are making it more resilient during, um, during periods of drought. And, and overall, you know, improving the soil structure of, of those fields um, and making it more resilient. Next slide, please. So at AFT, um, we put together nine soil health case studies across the nation to quantify the economic benefits of these soil health practices for family farmers. We used a partial budget analysis to estimate the net economic benefits that farmers have experienced from investing in soil health practices like no-till, strip-till, and cover crops. We also used USDA's nutrient tracking tool and USDA's Comet Farm tool to quantify the water quality and climate benefits of those practices. Um, and these case studies really show how these soil health practices across the United States can have both economic and environmental benefits. Next slide, please. So ideally, when we think about carbon markets, um, we, we think they could be an economic driver of conservation practice adoption, but they really have to be open to all, regardless of farm size or production system. They need to be fair to farmers. Um, they need to be real and verifiable, you know, using carbon registry best practices, but also transitional for the economy and designed for permanence with appropriate safeguards in place. Next slide, please. So recognizing that change does not take place overnight, one such goal could be to roughly triple the adoption of cover crops from the current 15 million acres to a total of 44 million acres. It's also important to determine whether EQIP and CSP payments for cover crops are high enough to help farmers overcome barriers to adoption as well as income loss. The success of conservation programs like EQIP and CSP and rapidly delivering cover crop adoption is really dependent upon adequate technical support on the land. The agency should look at ways to improve the TSP program or the Technical Service Provider Program as part of this emphasis on technical assistance. In addition, NRCS should also meet new demand by capitalizing on and expanding its ability to work with third parties and providing essential technical support. And we also need regional specific research on the best cover crop species to use, how they improve soil organic carbon, the amount of carbon sequestration that occurs from the different species, and their ability to increase the overall water holding capacity of the soil. And finally, we should explore crop insurance's role in conservation practice adoption. And I'll talk more about that on the next slide, please. So as we um, as we look at crop insurance, we, we recognize that crop insurance is a trusted safety net program. You know, it's a, it has established acceptance in the ag community, and because of its widespread use, crop insurance plays a significant role 
in shaping the decision-making in American agriculture. To identify additional opportunities to harmonize the crop insurance system with cover crops, um, we recommend that a study be conducted on additional insurance barriers to adoption and how such barriers can effectively be addressed. Next slide, please. We know that cover crops are one of the most effective tools that we have when it comes to reducing nutrient loss and promoting climate smart agriculture on farmland. This graphic shows the environmental outcomes from the 50,000 acres of cover crops that were enrolled in the fall covers for spring savings crop insurance premium discount program um, this past year in Illinois. Demonstrating the financial benefits of cover crops to farmers and expanding incentives for their adoption are crucial. Pilots, pilot programs in Iowa, Indiana, and, and Illinois have proven that incentives as low as $5 per acre can generate significant farmer interest in expanding cover crop adoption. This can be used as a template for similar programs in additional states. It also offers the opportunity to combine state, federal, and private funding for additional incentives that will have an even greater impact on the adoption of cover crops. Farmers accrue a lot of different costs across their operations. This includes a cost of, of adopting cover crops, which can average as much as $30 per acre for new adopters. We also know that this that it takes a few years for farmers to, to become a, um, more accustomed to new practices and, and to recoup some of that initial investment. And the $5 per acre can help relieve some of these costs by adopting cover crops as a regular practice by providing a discount on those crop insurance payments when farmers purchase their plans in the spring. The funding for the premium discount program goes directly from the individual State Department of Agriculture to the Risk Management Agency, which oversees the federal crop insurance program. Farmers do not receive any direct funding from the program and only see a savings as a discount on their crop insurance when they sign up for these plans in the spring. Next slide, please. And, and lastly, I want to talk about um, agricultural land. And we know that ag land offers significant opportunities for carbon sequestration. But when it's developed and when it's lost, the ability to harness these carbon sinks is also lost forever. New farmland development is often preceded by removing topsoil from the land, which causes stored carbon to be released back into the atmosphere. Development often disproportionately impacts nationally significant land, our nation's most productive, versatile, and resilient. Of the 11 million acres converted or threatened, um, almost 4.4 million were considered nationally significant agricultural lands. The loss of this land really pushes agriculture production to more marginal land, which can require greater inputs to receive, to achieve comparable production levels. And final slide, please. That's why we believe it's imperative that conservation practices on working agricultural lands and protecting farmland needs to be included in any meaningful climate strategy. Just like to thank you for your time today and I'm looking for any questions that, uh, that, that you all may have later in the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, an excellent presentation. That was um, uh, really interesting. Um, I have a quick follow-up for you. Um, you said you're a fifth generation. What was the first, what did the first generation farm? Was it sort of everything to make a go of it in, in Illinois or was it something that was specialized? Yeah, no, I, I think it was, um, you know, in the, in the late 1800s, um, you know, the, the typical farming, um, the typical crop rotation was uh, corn, hay, small grains of, of different oats, wheat, uh, things of those nature. Soybeans started to come into play in the, in the, I believe around the 1930s or so. Uh, originally, I think one of my grandfathers planted soybeans as a hay crop, um, kind of how it began. And of course, um, you know, we're not too far away from from ADM here in Decatur, Illinois, and and uh, you know, really revolutionized the the uh, soybean industry um, many years ago. So. A lot more diverse crop rotation. Uh, of course, livestock was integral in, to, in, in that um, in that operation, and a lot of different crops, smaller fields um, than what we have today. Yep, a lot fewer tractors back then, I'm sure. <laughs> a lot less mechanization. Uh, well, thanks for indulging my uh, my follow up question. Um, we are going to hear next from uh, Rob Schott, 
Rob has been with Casey Trees for three years as an arborist and director of tree operations. Previously, he worked as a garden designer for Cotswold Gardens in Shimizu uh, Landscape Design. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from Clemson University in Business Management. And he received a Professional Horticulture Diploma from Longwood Gardens and studied at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh in Scotland. Rob, welcome to the panel today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. I'm Rob Schott. Uh, I'm the Director of Tree Operations at Casey Trees, and um, I'm honored to have the opportunity to discuss climate solutions here today. Um, and I'd like to thank EESI and, and all the other panelists. Next slide, please. So Casey Trees is an urban forestry nonprofit in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to restore, enhance, and protect uh, the urban forestry of the nation's capital and to connect people to trees and through trees and to try to just help educate uh, and advocate for trees um, and, and inside the district, a very powerful city, but, but really trying to kind of expand our scope as well. Next slide, please. So simple goal amongst many other smaller goals, but the large goal is uh, a DC tree canopy of 40%. So that's using LIDAR, kind of top-down view of, of the city. So taking into account all the impermeable uh, pavement, asphalt, buildings, uh, grass also would not sort of count. This is just canopy coverage. So looking from the top down, just leaf coverage in in August, and we're looking to try to hit 40% uh, canopy coverage. We're currently at 37 and change, 37 and a you know quarter. So feels like we're close, but you know that that 2% and change is, is about 400 acres of increased canopy. And and you know obviously trees are a, a living being, and, and so trees are going to die. New new trees get planted, but it takes a while for them to get to full maturity, especially inside a, an urban forest with, with pretty challenging growing conditions. Next, please. So this, uh, I just wanted to give you a sense of Casey Trees, the growth we've had as an organization, uh, and, and then as, you know, even as a tree planting, tree operations department. So, you know, started out young and, uh, and we've just kind of steadily grown. Uh, 2020, as you know, many organizations and businesses had, had a little bit of a decline, had, had to sort of shut down operations in spring. But we are looking to hit 4,500 trees this uh, this year and looking to hit 5,000 in 2022. Next, please. Awesome. So this is a look into some of the, uh, the the programs that we offer. So, you know, green infrastructure is a huge part of what we do. Trees being, you know, a, a huge piece of green infrastructure. So we, we also do stormwater BMPs. So we do rain gardens. We plant a little bit of herbaceous material, you know, often planting uh, trees inside those BMPs as well. We do community events. So again, this connection of people to trees through trees. So we love having volunteer events, uh, you know, couldn't really do it without them. 2020 was a was a challenging year for for many different reasons, obviously. But we weren't able to have volunteer events, so we're looking we're looking to get back to uh, to doing volunteer events. Um, we also do pruning, tree inventories, and uh, we have a survival study of the installed trees we have. You know, I'm a big believer that we need to understand the location and the condition of of the, the trees the green assets if you will to truly understand their value and and their economic benefit next please i'm going to get into some uh gis maps and graphics to just you know give you a sense of how we you know strategize where we like to uh put our resources so we're fortunate enough to have several grants um through you know DC government, uh, and we feel very fortunate to get those, and, and they're they're for tree planting all over the city. So public space, private space, you know, Department of Interior, and you know, there's a lot of opportunity. So we need to make decisions on where we want to focus um, our tree installations. So this shows you on the left the uh, the wards. So there's eight wards in DC. We focus a lot of our attention in Ward Five, Ward Seven, and Ward Eight. 
and I'm going to get into a, a little bit of that strategy. So the middle image is uh, the MS4 uh, sewer, uh, sewer system, excuse me, com uh, compared to in the middle is the combined sewer system. So MS4 is, you know, environmentally speaking, uh, a higher focus. It is running directly into tributaries, creeks, uh, and, and into the Anacostia and the Potomac, obviously, Com the combined sewer system is being treated. So we focus a lot of our attention in the MS4 areas. And then on the right, you see uh, sort of heat index and, and heat islands. And, you know, there can be 10 to 12 degrees difference uh, in neighborhoods just inside the district, which is, you know, which is a small city. Uh, it, it generally focused around uh, the you know trash transfer station uh, neighborhoods that don't have a lot of tree canopy uh, railways things like that so you know in the northwest you'll see that it's much cooler um, and it's just frankly uh, more parks more trees um, and so that's a little bit of a segue into how we try to focus uh, where we do where we use our uh, resources next slide please So this is a pretty powerful um, collection of images. Um, it's income on the left, uh, the poverty below or above poverty line on the middle, and uh, then demographics on the right. And really simply put, what this shows is people below the poverty line with lower income and uh, you know people of color, it, it's all in the same areas of the district. And with that, we really, Catherine touched on this a bit as well, we're really trying to focus our attention and our resources in the areas that need it the most. It's not always the easiest access, you know, that there's sort of uh, thoughts of, of crime and safety that are, you know, uh, inherent with trees, which there's certainly uh, research that, that disproves that, but I completely understand uh, where the citizens are coming from. And I, you know, I absolutely, uh, try to sort of work with them and, and help them understand. Uh, but it is, uh, it, it's a pretty staggering three uh, graphics uh, for me. Um, but again, you know, we are trying to target these areas on the east and the south part of the district. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is the heat vulnerability map. This is um, uh, pulled from open data source. Uh, th this basically takes into account income, heat, Health again. Catherine touched upon it a little bit. Um, respiratory challenges, lower life expectancy in in some of these areas. And so then in the middle, uh, we have some some specific neighborhoods that we sort of you know deem to be target areas. So we're, we're putting our outreach um, into those areas. We're trying to connect with those communities to try to, to try to enter the community, but not just plant trees and walk away to, to engage the community, to educate so that people understand what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish. We're not trying to come in and gentrify a neighborhood. We're trying to come in and, and, and improve the value of, of certain areas that the health, um, environmental impact. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a very like, deep process of trying to engage communities. And I think what's really important to remember is when you have engagement, uh, the tree is gonna do better. Uh, there, there's gonna be more of a, um, a connection and people are more willing to give you a call when it's not doing well or water it or weed it, mulch it and that type of thing. So the, the, you know, the Casey trees sort of motto of connecting people to trees is, uh, is really key. It's not, we're not just a landscape contractor. We're really trying to connect and, and strategize where we're going based on needs. And then on the right, this is, um, it, it's a little bit tough to see, but it's, it's DCHA, so the Housing Association. And so what we do is we take these, you know, subsidized in, in public housing areas and we look at open canopy and, and we're trying to target these areas in wards five, seven, and eight. And so this is, you know, what my foresters and my sales team use uh, along with our outreach department as well. Next slide, please. Cool. So on the left, this is, uh, this is actually, um, as I've mentioned, we've gotten into uh, BMP, uh, best management practices, green infrastructure, rain gardens, bioswales, things like that. This is taking, um, this is DOEE's uh, a map of green infrastructure all over the city, publicly, publicly uh, on public lands. And we, uh, 
we're, we're starting to get into to management of these. So making sure the trees are doing well, you know, making sure the inlets are clear, uh, because to, to us, all of this is, is a very connected uh, sort of one big ecosystem and it's very connected. So it's not just trees. It's not just herbaceous and shrubs. It's it's all of it kind of placed together. And so we want to make sure these BMPs are being uh, are as successful as possible. And and so maintenance is a huge part of, you know, anything living. It's not a set and forget. It, it's really continuing to maintain water. It's a growing being. So it, it's important to kind of keep an eye on it. And then on the right, this just shows since since 2018, since I arrived at Casey Trees, this is uh, where we have focused our uh, tree planting efforts. So you know, obviously you see a little bit in the center, there's less efforts there. That's the combined sewer system. In fairness, that's also, you know, sort of downtown DC. So it's a, it's a little bit of a trickier pl place to be planting, um, less, less, you know, green, uh, green areas for sure. Uh, but we've done over 50% of our tree planting in wards five, seven, and eight, which is, uh, which is really, uh, I'm very proud of that, proud of the organization, proud of my team, and just really happy to be continuing our efforts in these areas. Next slide, please. Cool, so the, the obvious environmental impact, I mean, carbon sequestration, um, Catherine, again, you know, had a, had a really awesome throwback to, uh, to sort of biology class. That was, that was pretty fun, uh, talking about carbon sequestration. That was, I mean, that's great. Um, I think we sort of all recognize that trees do that, but I, it's, sometimes when you see the figures, it's hard to it's hard to imagine what 53 tons of carbon is. But just to think that 100 trees can have that much value, uh, it's just we have to continue to sort of restore and protect and continue to install these you know green infrastructures. Uh, and again, stormwater mitigation, especially in municipal areas. I mean, the water is just taking toxins, litter, and, and soil is actually a, another really big challenge, taking soil into the rivers and, and salt and changing the pH, which changes changes the entire dynamics of the river. Um, but I wanted to touch upon just, you know, some some simple numbers, economic value that, that trees can add that, you know, aren't always thought about. So in the middle, I, I discussed a little bit of shade trees and what they can just do for your cooling. I mean, no question, if you have a large shade tree, you know, it's like any day you go out and stand in the shade. I mean, it's considerably cooler that, you know, 56% um, change in your air conditioning cost. That's, I mean, that's astronomical, you know, so that's huge. Uh, you know, heating is not something that I think is often thought about in terms of just like their economic, you know, money in your wallet, sort of coins staying in your pocket. Um, evergreen screens and windbreaks. Um, you sort of see it at farms a good bit, windbreaks. Um near hoop houses and things because you know it, it's challenging to keep those to a temperature needed uh it can do a lot you know five percent of your heating is i mean that's impressive just having something that's aesthetically really beautiful you know mitigating stormwater sequestering carbon but also lowering your heating expenses and you know there's it's becoming more of a sort of trendy um a trendy the wall street journal just had a uh had, had an article about um sort of how the, this new status symbol, if you will, is having large trees and how there's firms that are that are actually transplanting large trees um, to people's properties because they want to have, you know, big white oak that their property doesn't have. And they want to look like their house has been sort of seated in this position for, for some extended period of time. So, you know, obviously the the environmental impact of trees and of stormwater mitigation is huge, but, but I, you know, I think as we're all here to discuss the the economic impact is is certainly notable next slide please yeah so to continue on sort of the economic impact and the value wanted to just touch upon uh three three quick things and then uh yeah and then i'll pass it off so casey trees helped pass legislation alongside the dc council Urban Forestry Division, which is a great partner of ours. Uh, they fund a lot of our tree planting on private locations, really couldn't do uh, much of what we do without the Urban Forestry Division, um, which is part of District Department of Transportation. Uh, so we, we created laws uh, that, that are essentially to protect special and heritage trees. So the trees that are having the greatest environmental impact, you know, it takes 10, 15 years for a tree really is creating that impact, kind of becoming net zero. And then it's starting to really uh, 
you know, just be a, a producer of environmental impact, if you will. And so what it says is you basically can't cut down special inherited trees uh, unless they're hazards or dangerous and even on a private property. So special tree is, you know, 44 inch circumference and a heritage tree is a hundred inch circumference. And, you know, even if you're having a construction project or you just, you know, maybe want to expand your garage or what have you, you, you have to pay to cut these trees down. Uh, it's I, personally, I think it's, it's a great thing because these are just valuable resources. And so, you know, uh, a heritage tree, hundred inch, circumference or 31 inch diameter maybe a little bit easier to understand which is a big tree no question but trees that we see you know probably every day you know without really recognizing we see heritage trees every single day i mean you you would incur a, a thirty thousand dollar fee if you if you took that tree down uh without it being deemed hazardous so that's very substantial and sort of goes to show how important this is and sort of speaks to the economic value of these trees. Uh, and then I wanted to touch upon just another sort of simple way that um, trees are, are given a value, sort of monetized uh, for property values and things like that. Um, and this is this is called the trunk formula. And, and so it's essentially taking into account species, the location, the health, the environmental sort of benefits. So the carbon sequestration, the stormwater mitigation based on species. So a white oak, much more valuable than a dogwood. You know, a, you know, a smaller flowering tree is less valuable than a large uh, shade oak tree, beech tree, something you might be familiar with. Uh, and also forecasted longevity to, to provide. Um, so, you know, a tree that a, a sugar maple, for example, might have a little bit of a lower rating given its growing zones, uh, you know, just with, with real climate change and, and how it's getting warmer and uh so it's based on all of those things it, it gives it a, a value so if it's like in your garden something like that so you know a, a 20 inch 22 inch uh, white oak would be you know given a value at over thirteen thousand dollars and i think that's valuable also just like very important i think and helps sort of educate people helps us understand that this is this is a very valuable resource for the environment, but but also there is there is it's fiscally valuable. I mean, it, it monetizes it. I think that's the way of the world these days. That, that's an important it's an important aspect. And uh, one um, last area I'd like to sort of discuss is um, stormwater retention credits. Uh, so that's that's another uh, sort of valuable green infrastructure economic uh, resource. So. The Nature Conservancy uh, does some of this. Uh, we work with them uh, to do a, as a, a contractor, essentially. Uh, so simply put, uh, you know, there's a lot more depth than what I'm going to get into. That's for a whole other debate. But but simply put, it's, it's green infrastructure, trees, stormwater BMPs, permeable pavers, you know, things along those lines that, that can be purchased by, by a landholder to, to offset their inability to actually manage the required stormwater on their site, on their property. So, you know, an example might be a, a new condo building, uh, you know, which is built and they want to have, a, you know, a roof pool, uh, you know, a dining area, you know, something along that for their, you know, to help them sell their building um, rather than a green roof. So essentially they're incapable of, you know, maintaining and mitigating the stormwater that would be required of them on, you know, by the Department of Energy and Environment. So what happens is these credits, these BMPs, they're installed on, you know, private land in the MS4 uh, stormwater zone. And then that, you know, contractor or building owner will purchase the credits from another landholder. So maybe a cemetery or something along those lines. They'll purchase them, again, to offset uh, their inability to, to manage the stormwater. So, you know, I think in DC, it's a little bit in its infancy. Other um, other countries have certainly, I think, uh, done more with stormwater retention credits than we have, but it's, you know, it's, it's essentially a, a, a currency, which, you know, I, I think if you're gonna talk, uh, you know, sort of economic value, that, that certainly becomes a big piece of it. So stormwater retention credits are something I'm very 
proud to, to be involved with. And I think it's something that in time will become more and more uh, valuable. Um, so again, appreciate it. It was, a, it was a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. And uh, thanks to all the other panelists uh, so far. It's been great to hear your presentation. It really has. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, and I am going to resist every temptation to ask you about cicadas because we need to move uh, to our <laughs> That's all anybody we can touch wants upon to it later if need be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can get to that later. But anyway, uh, it's actually more important for today's purposes to hear from our next panelist, uh, Chris Adamo. Chris is Vice President at Danone North America for Federal and Industry Affairs. Um, he assists the world's largest B Corp with strengthening the role of business and driving social and environmental good for all. He helps Danone North America navigate a confluence of issues related to public policy especially to help the known sustainably grow and provide healthier options. Chris, welcome to the panel today. I'm looking forward to your presentation too. All right, thanks for having me. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you're watching from. Um, Pleasure to be here. I'm going to do a couple things here. Number one, briefly, just talk a little bit about who Danone is. You may not know the company, but you probably know some of our brands here in the United States. And I um, want to talk, a, then get into how we're a bit of a implementer and investor in natural climate solutions. So hopefully can walk you through some of those examples and also the policy angle where uh, we are an advocate. We, we do engage in public policy. We, we feel it's an important part of the overall puzzle is how we operate as a, uh, a food company here in the United States and globally, frankly, uh, towards nat natural climate solutions. Next slide, please. Uh, very important to us. This is something that is um, front and center to everybody that works at Danone, both our purpose and our vision, which I think are relevant for the conversation today. I mean, just fundamentally as a food company, um, reminding ourselves daily that we are bringing health or food to as many people as possible. And then complementing that, this dual vision, uh, right? As a food company, we think obviously first and foremost about human health. Um, but that the planet is there to support that as well. So One Planet, One Health is something that is a part of our uh, daily operations and daily thinking. Next slide, please. Again, this is just a quick glimpse of our US brands and, and just so you know who we are as a business because this, again, does pertain to how we think about investing in nature. Um, you probably know us as Dannon, a yogurt company here in the United States uh, going back to the 1940s, uh, one of the oldest and, and first uh, yogurt brands here in the US. I mean, we're, we're over a hundred year old company globally, uh, started in Barcelona, Spain back in 1919 as a yogurt company. We've since expanded quite a bit since then um, into the premium milk market. Horizon Organic is a, is a very big organic dairy brand here in the US. Um, in the plant base as well, we, we, we are a big dairy company, but we are also a one of the largest plant-based alternative companies with brands like Silk and So Delicious. And then the water bottles. Uh, bottling water is a big part of our business. Evian is the big brand that you know here in the US. Um, and then specialized nutrition, Happy Family. If you're like me and have uh, small kids running around the house, Happy Family might be a brand that you're familiar with um, in large organic baby food company. Um, that's just a quick sampling of some of our bigger brands. But if you think about, again, the the supply chains, the commodities that, that feed those brands, that's really where we're going to get to uh, first and foremost as, as a part of our nature-based uh, strategy. Next slide, please. And again, just again, to give you a, a little bit of a mental map of how we operate here in the U.S., uh, we have facilities, 12 across the U.S. in particular, two headquarters, New York and Colorado. Um, what's not on that map are our supply chain farmers. Um, and I'll get to this a little bit, but dairy in particular being our biggest commodity, our most important commodity uh, in terms of volume and size, we work with over uh, just about 700 farms across the U.S. And that's pretty unique for a company our size to have that line of sight to those farmers. Uh, in many cases, we have direct con contracts with those farms. Um, in many cases, also many of those contracts are long-term contracts that we actually have a year, two, three years, in some cases, five to seven year contracting, which really sets up a different type of relationship between us and the farm. And uh, we can talk a little bit about risk and farming. And we think it sets up a different sort of business relationship where the risk is a little bit more distributed and we can think about doing things a little more innovatively with those farms. Next slide, please. 
Again, another one of these taglines. Yes, I know it's a, it's a little bit of corporate marketing here, but, but it's important. It's a part of our culture, a part of our vision. Um, we do believe that that we as individuals working in the company and you as the consumer can can help vote for the, the type of world that we want. Um, it matters in politics. It matters as a consumer. And so this is an important part of our, our ethos. Next slide, please. Uh, another big piece of this is that we we are not your typical global company. We are uh, a public benefit corp here in the United States. Up until about a couple of weeks ago, we were the largest public benefit corp. Um, if you don't know what that is, take a look. There's about 25, 26 states here in the United States that allow public benefit corp registration. Anybody can go create one. Um, but it's pretty unique as a publicly traded company to have that sort of designation. And, and basically, in essence, what it does is it allows us to state our social vision within our corporate um, registration. And for us, that's both health and sustainability. Um, the B Corp or B Lab is a nonprofit that then certifies us every two years. Uh, you don't have to do this as a public benefit corp, but we choose to do it because, again, it gives us that extra third party uh, map about where we can continuously improve in terms of our governance, our sustainability programs, and overall just how we work with our communities and our workforce. So it, it looks at a whole aspect of the business and how it's run, and again, gives that kind of third party validation and transparency to, to what it is we're doing. We just got recertified. Uh, we were first certified in 2018, 2020. Every two years you get recertified. It's quite a undertaking for a company our size to do this, and we're working with B-Lab and others for more and more companies our size to do this. You might be familiar with other uh, leaders in this space, such as Patagonia and Ben and & Jerry's, which are notable um, B Corps. But you can go on the B-Lab website and check out kind of a whole network of growing businesses that are taking on this, this um, uh, both cultural and legal designation to say that we're not just here to uh, return uh, profit for our shareholders, but we're also here to do good for a larger stakeholder audience. And that's a really key critical part of the business. Next slide, please. Um, sorry, you can skip one more. Thanks. From a sustainability standpoint, um, these are the four buckets that we think about uh, from a strategical standpoint. Uh, climate change arguably actually could be the overall umbrella to all of these things, um, but we do designate there are some water pieces, uh, circular economy, that's our packaging, the materials that go into our products, uh, things like plastics and, and creating new uh, materials that are uh, either recycled or biodegradable or a big piece of the overall pie. And then again, because we are a food company, agriculture is such a key component uh, to the business. And I'll get to this in a minute. This, the agriculture, if I could, agriculture could draw a nice little line to water there and it should draw a nice little line to climate. It, it links to both overall. But we keep it separate for a few reasons because there is number one, economic. Uh, arguments for looking at agriculture as a company. We want certainty and stability on pricing and resilience. Um, I spoke about those 700 farms that we work with directly with. Uh, we'd like to work with the same farms over and over if we can. Um, so the health of the farms and the resilience of those farms matter to us as a business. Next slide, please. A uh, little more detail about some of the commitments and uh, in, in the areas of climate, packaging, and agriculture. I'm going to point out in particular on climate change. Uh, we are science. We are dedicated to a science-based target. That's a third-party governance uh, where we have uh, committed to a 30% net reduction, whole company globally by 2030, and then a 50% um, reduction in carbon intensity to our supply chain, or sometimes it's called a scope three. Um, that's a pretty big jump. I mean, that's not an area that we ever anticipate being regulated on, for example. I mean, that is a voluntary action that us and many others are now taking within science-based targets. Again, it kind of ties back to knowing our supply chain, creating clear lines of sites and transparency, and then finding new different strategies, depending on, for us, what the commodity may be. Um, and that's going to look very different. Obviously, palm uh, coming from Indonesia is one strategy, and then dairy in the United States is going to be a very different strategy, but they both require a line of transparency and understanding what's going on in that supply chain in order to enact change. Uh, it's not buying a commodity through the black hole system is, is not, uh, not an easy way to do sustainability impact. Next slide, please. 
So regenerative agriculture is a term that has crept up more and more. Uh, I've been with the company three years. I think I first learned about the term three years ago when I joined. Um, it's open for debate as to what it means. Uh, soil health practices are clearly a part of regenerative agriculture. Another term that gets used often, I certainly use it, is climate smart agriculture. Uh, these things can mean different things to different people, but for us, again, it's a broad umbrella for thinking about agricultural management. Uh, certainly at the crop side of things, the feed that go to our cows, for example, uh, can also entail different management practices in the barn uh, with the animals uh, for dairy, for example. So the overall theory being that we can do more restore, not just do less bad, but actually restore uh, through management practices at the, at the farm side. And then also, also thinking about the health, again, of the farm and the health of the animals in, in terms of a livestock system. So it's a very holistic way of thinking. Next slide, please. So we started uh, here in the United States um, in our regenerative journey with soil, with the crops uh, that feed the cows in particular, um, thinking about the different systems is whether for us we're drawing milk out of the northeast we're drawing milk out of the midwest and we also have some western systems that we draw milk out of both texas kansas uh, idaho and california to be exact so as you can imagine those are some very diverse uh, agricultural regions uh, where for example water varies quite a bit amongst those regions and size of fields and types of fields gradient varies across those systems as well um, soil health as, as actually was put quite well from my previous speakers here. Um, there's a lot of fundamental practices, whether it's cover crops or types of tillage or nutrient management that make up soil health practices. Uh, we also get into edge of field practices like different buffer uh, systems. Um, these are things that we've got to play with. We've got to work with the farm and we have to experiment. They're going to look different in different places. Um, just as was mentioned earlier, cover crop varietals and types and just uh, cover crop termination uh, management practices can vary quite a bit. So we undertook this back in 2018, put a $6 million commitment down to begin experimenting and piloting with farms who are willing to do this in our system. Uh, now, fast forward almost four years later, we're uh, now entering year four of our of our program. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, it will get a little bit uh, easier to follow. Thanks. Um, we announced our year three update last December, so now entering year four. Um, we have 82,000 acres enrolled uh, across those various regions. I think we're up to nearly 40 farms now enrolled. We expect to be about 100,000 acres by the end of this year. And when I say enrolled, what I mean by that is it's a very intensive data benchmarking process. Uh, we pay for that service through a partner group called Sustainable Environmental Consultants. Uh, they are uh, the partner or inter intermediary at times between us and the farm. So for example, when that data is collected, uh, they ensure that it's kept private for the farm. The farm still owns that data. We don't hold it. We don't, uh, we don't do anything with that data other than learn about the results of their actions. So we get that benchmark first and foremost in year one when a producer enrolls. And then after that, we're able to do annual monitoring and tracking. So if they're implementing a new practice, we can then start to compare and see the impact across those systems. And carbon and greenhouse gases is certainly our main KPI, but we're also looking at water. We're also looking at biodiversity and again, economic resilience. We actually have an RO, uh, economic ROI model that we use with the farm to start to sense, again, it's alluded to very well earlier, so I won't go in depth, but inputs, for example, become a, a big part of this. You know, can we reduce inputs? Uh, it may be an herbicide, it may be uh, the run, diesel use, uh, irrigation efficiency, a whole number of things that can improve the overall efficiency of that farm. So these, this is a full data collection system that we're using with our producers. Uh, it can be a little onerous and a little burdensome to get in first time, but once we get a producer in, that data starts becoming quite useful in providing not just uh, learnings about what the impact is, but also a map about what future potential investments can look like. Next slide, please. So we're doing this corporate wide. Danone, as I mentioned, is a lot of different brands. Um, just taking dairy alone, we have both organic, non-GMO, and conventional systems enrolled in our program. Uh, we also, this past year, as I think the previous slide mentioned, we have almonds now uh, in our system as well. Uh, silk almond milk would be a big recipient of those, for example. Um, but here with Horizon Organic, um, it is, 
probably the largest organic dairy brand uh, in the country or perhaps in the world. It's a significant supply of milk for us. So we saw the opportunity with Horizon Organic to start using the power of our brand to actually be not only a driver of implementation down in the supply chain, but also as a way to start connecting with consumers about what it is we're doing and hopefully draw some value from them and educate uh, and get them along the journey. So we, a year ago, uh, committed to being carbon positive 2025. That's um, another way of saying carbon neutral. That's going to be the certification that we attempt to reach by then. Uh, the this is value chain wide. It's not just the farms, I should be clear. So it's from our processing facilities to our packaging down to the farm, we'll be measuring um, the overall impact. In fact, we just put a life cycle analysis up on our website if you'd like to check it out. It's a very, I think, very fun, interesting attempt at taking a very complicated, wonky piece of material and putting some fun infographics around it so people can understand what it is, what our greenhouse gas impact is along the entire value chain. Uh, not surprisingly, over half of that impact is at the farm. So again, when we think about our limited budget and, and where the investment should go, most of that is should be going and it will be going to the farms that are enrolled in our program. Next uh, slide, please. The other piece I'd like to mention to this, again, 2025 is right around the corner, um, becoming, having 100% zero impact within our supply chain definitely is not gonna happen by 2025, and one could argue may never happen. I don't know that these systems ever can get to a true net zero in and of them by themselves. But when we think of carbon neutral, we are gonna be thinking outside our supply chain too. So another form of natural climate uh, solution investments can be through the voluntary market to help complement and supplement this overall value chain investment. So we don't look at it so much as an either or. I mean, certainly we'd prefer to be investing first and foremost with the farms in our, in our supply chain. But as we start to think about how to get that overall planetary impact that we want, uh, we need to think outside the supply chain. So we are now starting to look at various voluntary investments um, in the carbon market. And we have not yet made any uh, yet, but the team is now starting to build out what that looks like. And we want those investments for this brand in particular to stay in the United States. So we're looking at forestry projects, grassland projects, and potentially some future agricultural projects too that might meet um, some of the emerging uh, voluntary market standards. So this is an exciting piece of the overall uh, strategy and program that we'll be building out in the years to come. Next slide, please. And one more slide. So this is the piece where I have to remind uh, everybody that, and this is an important piece, so we can do a lot of good within our supply chain, within our business operations, and that's important for us to do it. Um, but we believe we also have to advocate and have to call for better policy. Uh, not just to help ourselves, but to help the community at large of folks in the land sector, of folks in the food and agricultural sector in particular. Um, we all know that this is not a localized problem that we're trying to solve, but um, policy is going to be absolutely key to working alongside the private sector and accelerating our efforts and, uh, um, you know, just overall, we know where we have to be by 2050 and if not sooner. And so one company alone is not going to do that. Um, had a colleague of mine, Tina Owens, uh, testify uh, about a year and a half ago in front of the House. Um, we continue to use our voice in many different formats. Um, in fact, just recently last week submitted some comments to the Department of Agriculture here in the United States, uh, giving some explanations or, or at least our opinions about how we think some of the public policy at USDA can bolster activities such as ours and other food companies, um, work with farms better to build voluntary markets. You can check that document out. It's in the Federal Register public domain. Um, but another example of ways that we are thinking about advocating and growing our voice is through coalitions. And we, co we work in coalitions with environmental groups. Um, and we also work in coalitions with other companies. And one example of that is to the right there on the slide, the Sustainable Food Policy Alliance. And we built this, it's actually a young group we built uh, two and a half years ago, summer of 2018. Uh, it is four companies. It's us to known, but also Mars, Unilever, and Nestle. And it's three other fairly like-minded companies who are trying to provide a bigger social impact in a number of different ways. Uh, as like-minded food companies, we often find ourselves advocating similarly for nutrition policy, uh, labeling policy, food safety policy, but sustainability and climate policy has become one of our biggest work streams. And so uh, I just wanted to point that out that, you know, 
I used to work in the Senate for a number of years. I've worked in the executive branch in the past. Rarely did I have food companies lobbying me for better agriculture or better climate policy. So I personally, and, I, and the company agrees with me, believes that this is an important step forward uh, in public policy to add another important set of voices to the, to the table. Certainly not, and many times we're agreeing and working with environmental groups, uh, it, our opinions aren't necessarily that novel, but again, it's just a way to amplify and hopefully build an overall uh, chorus of, of important voices to get the change we need. Next slide, please. Another thing we've been working on uh, as a public policy advocate is actual, again, this kind of ties the policy to the implementation. We've been trying to get grants uh, with USDA. And I want to be clear, this is not an ask uh, of public dollars to Danone, but this is an ask of public dollars to farms in our system. Um, so when we put up a dollar of our budget, we're asking to get a dollar of USDA budget to match so that we can, in some cases, double our efforts at, in, within our supply chain. Uh, we've had one grant successful so far. We've used National Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation as a partner there. They're actually the lead grant applicant, uh, not to known. Um, but we have been working with them. This is actually be year two of the grant coming up uh, from a 2018 Farm Bill program that we worked on called uh, Soil Health On-Farm Trial Program. It's, if you know USDA programs, it's a part of the Conservation Innovation Grant programs. Uh, we were lucky enough to get $3 million dedicated to building soil health um, systems within our supply chain. And last year put out about 1.5 million matched again by our dollars, uh, Danone budget dollars, and we'll put out uh, a very similar amount this year. Uh, the hope here is that we can then take some of these learnings, again, going back to what I described earlier, some of the data that we're collecting, and actually be able to showcase some case studies across our supply chain. And hopefully case studies that will be big, small, medium farms uh, across different regions of the country too, so we can get some different learnings on cover crops and tillage and nutrient management and some uh, buffer systems. Uh, another example of a project we co-invested in this past year are some very uh, interesting manure management techniques. Uh, manure, again, with dairies, there's we're learning more and more there needs to be a, an array or spectrum of options on manure. Uh, many of you might have heard of biodigesters. Uh, it's a wonderful technology that works for some large farms, not so well often for medium and smaller farms, which uh, is a large population of our supply chain. So we've been looking at a whole host of different uh, manure options for different farms, depending on what the fit and need is. So that's just another example of what this grant is helping us sort through and, and find a ways. And, Hopefully, again, uh, a year, two, three years from now, we'll have more concrete data to say a little bit more specifically what we think some of the better economic and environmental options are for different farms, again, depending on the region and depending on the size. Next slide, please. Uh, a little duplicative here, I apologize, but again, another reference to our Sustainable Food Policy Alliance. Um, I think this is the last slide on the deck. I'll just quickly wrap up, maybe a little more on the public policy side. There are a lot of great ideas out there. In fact, in my 15 years of experience of public policy on, on agriculture, sustainable policy, I've never seen this much energy <laughs> behind, uh, behind land sector policy and agriculture specifically. It's a great opportunity. It, it may be one of the biggest windows we've ever seen in terms of a, having massive constituency uh, from companies to NGOs to farms, perhaps for the first time ever, uh, calling for very similar things, the technical assistance, the research, the financing opportunities that USDA hopefully can be a really large opportunity for. So I'm very op optimistic that um, some good things are going to be coming down the pipe. Um, we've been working, I think, on a pretty good trajectory over the last couple of years for better policy, but I think right now we, we've got an energy that I've never seen before. So very excited to see that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that presentation. Um, and thanks also to uh, Catherine, Chris, and Rob for their presentations as well. We are going to transition now. We have a few moments for questions and um, and discussion. And I'm going to uh, are going to pull a question from our audience. Um, someone um, sent us an email um, asking about basically making the point that what we're talking about today with respect to natural climate solutions, it's, it's going to be taking place over time. Our situation with respect to mitigation and adaptation is changing. Um, and the work that you, the four of you have described today will be happening alongside things like increased urbanization, water scarcity, um, uh, the 
changes in transition between young forests to farmland changing over time. Catherine, we'll st I'd like to start with you and then we can go through the panel sort of in the order of the presentations, but how do we address sort of the, the fact that our landscape is changing and how do we build in sort of staying power to the natural climate solutions that we're working on so that they don't go away because of trends impacting them, you know, five to 10 years from now? No, that's a great question. It is really important that as we think about how to design natural climate solutions that we think about not only today, but what will be happening uh, 20 and 30 years from now uh, when uh, we really need to make sure we've eliminated uh, emissions. And, uh, and so that means up front, thinking about uh, the kinds of trees we plant, where we plant them, what we should be doing to make sure they're going to be trees that are successful in their location in the future. Uh, it's about uh, looking at how we can improve how we uh, make decisions about the design of our communities, not only to reduce transportation emissions, but also to make our communities healthier and to reduce the conversion of land. Uh, so each of each policy needs to think about the situation we're in today or each strategy, the situation we're in today and then what might be coming uh, down the road in the future and make sure we're using the right tools in the right places. Thanks. Um, Chris Reynolds. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, great, great question. You know, I think, you know, as we look um, farmland protection is one of, you know, one of the ways to um, combat climate change, you know, focusing on, on you know, not, uh, you know, focusing on that, you know, most, uh, prime and resilient farmland and making sure we keep it in, uh, keep it in production. Um, but also, you know, looking at, you know, becoming more diverse in, in, in a lot of our areas, um, getting back to a more diverse crop rotation, you know, providing more diversity, more opportunities for, uh, for cover crop usage uh, within those operations. Um, but also learning more about, you know, how beneficial cover crops can be and, and I think gaining more knowledge about um, the, the many benefits that they can provide uh, farmers and, and landowners and and I think that's also another big um, you know a, a big thing that's going to be happening in the next few years we're going to see a lot of land that will be changing hands um, you know currently a, a vast amount of the farmland is is owned by non-operating landowners and so um, you know, we have to we have to not only educate the farmers about the benefits of conservation practices, but also the landowners that are um, that own the land. Thanks. And, and Rob, your your business happens in a very urban area. Um, how are these yeah, trends impacting your work at Casey Trees? Yeah, absolutely, super applicable. And, and those were those were both uh, very strong answers. And it's a great question. You know, I think a, a lot of it just real simple is sort of like a policy work, uh, you know, advocating for protection of natural lands or incentivizing, um, you know, new installation of green infrastructure. And, and something I think Catherine just kind of touched upon is, and Chris as well, is, you know, as an installation, you know, sort of organization, um, and in some respects, sometimes a, a subcontractor, I think it's really important to to promote biodiversity, to promote sort of uh, plants that, you know, sort of function over fashion. So, you know, plants that are going to really have an impact with phytoremediation, with stormwater mitigation, you know, so it, it's not just, you know, a small flowering tree in, in, you know, a certain, you know, it's not just a unit, a tree is not just a tree, it's a tree. It's, it's planting the right tree in the right location that can have the largest impact in the future. Um, I think that's I think that's very important from people in my shoes, but I think that in reality a big piece of it is uh, is is going to be policy. Mm -hmm. okay. And Chris, yeah, I think for a company like ours doing the work we're doing, uh, again, pretty rural settings mainly um, with the farms that we're operating in, um, but very different rural settings, right? I mean, if you look at the Northeast, uh, just take our, the dairies that we buy milk from in Vermont, uh, state New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, these are areas that by and large, I mean, literally hundreds of dairies that we buy milk from in that region alone. And uh, the vast majority of them are definitely under 200 cows. 
many are under 100 cows. And if you know anything about dairy right now, that's a bit of an anomaly, <laughs> especially in the Midwest, or let alone get to the West. Um, so number one, finding business models that keep those producers in production, number one, is, is highly important to us. We need milk in that region, and, and we need to make it work for those farms. Um, and two, um, being flexible, I think, um, in, the, in terms of thinking what is the right business model. Like if we keep running the same business model over and over and expect it to work in all places, then it's, we're not going to be highly successful for a number of reasons. And number two, we've got to be flexible with the farms. We've got to meet them where they're at, right? Each landowner is going to have their own unique uh, challenges and perspectives and sometimes just um, – you know, family barriers or, or whatever it may be. Uh, there's a number of, of always obstacles and challenges, but being flexible and being optimistic because a lot of cool things can get done. And then how do we take that optimism and find the small wins? And then hopefully there's a tipping point where it becomes a little more commonplace across our value chain or perhaps even just across uh, agriculture in general. Like we've talked about so many of these things for years. I think what I find optimistic about it is, you know, say 10 years ago, it was all about the four hours. We talked four hours, four hours, four hours. Then we talked, you know, cover crop. We came to this big revelation how amazing cover crops are. Well, now it's not one practice. We're thinking, I think, a little bit more holistically across a whole number of practices. And to me, that it's hard definitely not easy it can be overwhelming sometimes for some producers but there to me there's a lot of optimism that comes with that because we again Catherine I think you had it on your slide 20 40 50 dollars an acre in 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 a lot of that savings I'm guessing those are input efficiencies most mm -hmm. likely in many cases um, we're seeing the same thing even 20 dollars an acre is a massive jump for some producers to find that now you might ask well why aren't they just doing that on their own if that's the case but it's not that simple they need a partner they need a journey to get there in many cases. And it may take two or three crop seasons too, in some cases to find that efficiency. So there's a lot to be optimistic for, but um, it's, we gotta be flexible and we gotta be nimble in our thinking. I yeah, think one other point, sorry. Oh, uh, Catherine, go, go why don't ahead, we go Catherine. to you and then we'll follow up with Rob. Just brief, briefly, adaptive management is really important. And uh, that just highlights the importance of continual investment and in research and development and in the monitoring that we need to do to, to give us the feedback on when we need to change a practice uh, in the future. Yeah, Bob, no question. Offer yeah, one other, just small thing, and this is a bit outside my purview, but I think it's the flexibility and creativity and really just thinking a little bit more expansively. I mean, you know, the last 15 months it, it had shown us, and specifically in DC, I mean, the space that has been allocated towards you know, urbanization is going to be, I think, largely focused in the fact that there's a lot of need for housing and people moving to coasts and to, and to municipalities. Well, they need places to live. And as that number grows, that's going to be more and more development. You know, we've sort of shown, I mean, in, in large respects, my team needs to come in and grab a truck and grab the trees. But, you know, we're all like we're all at home. So maybe repurposing some of these like dwellings that have been sitting fallow, uh, you know, no pun intended for the farm talk, but have been just sitting and still are, I mean, that could be used for housing. So K Street, downtown DC, maybe that switches a little bit and, and we have a more creative model of how we work and how we use space, I think could go a long way to, you know, accommodate, but decrease development. Thanks. Uh, that was a great set of answers, and um, thanks to um, the person in our audience who asked that today. Um, we have time for one more, and many of you, actually all of you, um, talked um, um, about um, adaptation, but I think it's fair to say that most of your presentations maybe talked a little bit more about mitigation. So I'd like to go through the list, the, the roster once more, and Catherine, we can start with you again. Um, I'd like to help, just if you have in a few words, help our audience understand maybe where some of the best opportunities are for nature or natural climate solutions to contribute to our resilience and our ability to adapt to climate change while we're also reducing emissions and, and sequestering carbon. Absolutely, I think um, my mind first goes to our coastlines and our floodplains. I think those are two places where uh, we can get double benefits, both mitigation benefits through uh, protection and restoration of uh, uh, tidal wetlands on the coast and uh, floodplains uh, anywhere. So those are those are two places where we're going to get both adaptation and mitigation benefits. Thanks. 
Uh, Chris? Yeah, so I think as I talked about earlier in my presentation, you know, we we've seen a slight uptick in conservation practice adoption, but we have a we have a lot of room for improvement. And um, you know, I, I think we look at these soil health management systems um, that include cover crops and no-till and, and nutrient management and that suite of practices. And we know we have a we have a lot of room for improvement. And and these these practices can go a long way to not only combat climate change but also you know, specifically, you know, what we've been working on here in the Midwest a lot uh, over the past several years is uh, improving water quality in the Gulf of Hi uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the hypoxia zone. So, um, you know, I think we we have a long ways to go um, to reach some of those goals, and and we have to continue to work with farmers and landowners to show the benefits. And um, you know, as as Chris mentioned too, I, I think we have to have uh, the the technical service providers. Um, to help them along this journey and 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 make sure that they're prepared um, to um, to adopt these practices, but also we want them to be successful in uh, in in adopting these practices so that they can maintain them for the long term. Thanks, um, Rob. Could you explain a little bit more about maybe some of the resilience and adaptation benefits of your work? Sure. I think uh, you know it's interesting. I think just to, to to dial it down just slightly, I think, you know, just on a real personal level, uh, and not just me, but humans in general, I think, you know, there's a lot of literature, a lot of studies, you know, a lot, you know, to, to steal a little bit from Chris and, and Danone's sort of like ethos, but, you know, every decision we make has a huge impact. And I think if, if as just a conglomerate, if we can sort of make better decisions, each decision has so much weight that trickles downstream. I mean, everything really kind of, runs around clean water and storm water, uh, in my opinion. And, and if we can just dial things down and adapt sort of as a culture and as, as, a, as a society, I think it will go such a long way just in simple decision. I mean, just how much has changed in the last 18 months in terms of footprint, just because we were sort of forced to, but we can make these decisions as organizations, large, huge corporate organizations, small nonprofits, farming. I mean, I think, you know, you're always going to need huge, large farms, and, and there's also going to be small farms. And I think we can all sort of make these simple decisions, you know, as a as a sort of a collective people that will just go so far to to improving kind of like some of the challenges we're dealing with. Thanks, Chris Adamo. I think that gives Danone the last word on the panel today. No, no. Uh, well, I think it's almost impossible for us, at least at the farm level, to separate mitigation from adaptation resilient. I mean, the tie and the Venn diagram is so tight there uh, on most of these things. I mean, as was just mentioned, the soil health practices alone, I mean, whether it's uh, the crop, you may mitigate for climate and maybe we get more CO2 in the, in the ledger as a result of some of these um, practices, but at the same time, you're building that resilience. You know, the water distribution in the field is better. Uh, the, you know, you might be able to get a crop in where your neighbors might not, you know, if you're running good cover crops and, and, and good tillage efforts, especially in some of these un, unseasonal spring, wet springs we might be having. Um, we've got some very arid growers in Western Kansas, for example, where, you know, I hate to say it, but local uh, NRCS didn't want to spend money on cover crops. They didn't think it was doable. And those guys are going in and running better irrigation systems and running meters in their field and burning less diesel as a result. And, and also being able to do some cover crops and having overall not just greater carbon benefits, but the, the resilience and adaptation benefits are massive there. So they're super tightly related, which is uh, encouraging because it gives us a couple more things to value, uh, not just a ton of carbon. Well, thank you for that. That was a great way to end the panel. Um, and um, I'd like to uh, express sincere thanks to our panelists, Catherine, Chris, Robert, and Chris, for joining us today to talk about natural climate solutions um, for excellent presentations. If anyone in our audience would like to go back and rewatch anything or, um, or view additional materials, just as a reminder, that can be done very easily by visiting us online at www.esi.org. Um, and uh, it wouldn't be a briefing if I didn't plug multiple times our uh, climate change solutions newsletter. It comes out every two weeks, and it's the best way to keep up with everything that we're doing at EESI. Um, I'd like to also express uh, my thanks to our new friends at U.S. Nature for Climate for making our session today possible, um, and special, special thanks to um, project manager Nathan Henry for being such a great partner 
as we plan the session today. Thank you, Nathan, for everything you did um, in the run-up to today's event. Thank you very much. Um, also, like to thank everyone in our audience. Um, we had a big audience today. Thank you for that. And um, while I'm the one on camera, uh, by no means am I the only one at ESI who does any work, um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone on the team here who uh, helps make these briefings available. Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Totteroff, Anna McGinn, Omri Laporte, and our interns, uh, Celine, Jocelyn, Kimmy, and Rachel. And today actually is our last day with Celine and Rachel. So not just thanks, but also best of luck, Celine and Rachel, in your future endeavors. We get Jocelyn and Kimmy for a little while longer. Um, it's uh, always too bad when our interns leave, and um, Celine and Rachel have been two of the best. So thank you so much. Um, let's go to the next slide um, as we wrap up here. Um, uh, this is a slide with a survey link. Um, it's a huge help to us if uh, folks in our audience would take two moments uh, and help us by filling out the survey. It's a great way for us to um, understand how we're doing, if you had any technical issues, any audio issues, if I was fidgeting too much. Uh, all feedback is fair game. Um, sorry we didn't get to the cicadas today, but we were out of time. We have to do another briefing on cicadas. Maybe we'll have a cicada come in and be a panelist if we can figure that out. Um, uh, but anyway, if you have a moment, please take the survey. It's a huge help for us. Um, it really does improve our product and our ability to um, bring information to Congress. The last thing I will say uh, is just one last quick plug. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, May 12th at 2 p.m., uh, we will be having a briefing. It's our next briefing. Ambition and Opportunity in America's New Climate Commitments, U.S. Pledges to Reduce Emissions More Than 50% by 2030. We will have uh, three excellent panelists. My colleague Anna McGinn will co-moderate with me. Uh, it's going to be a really, really excellent session. So if you haven't already rsvp for that, I hope you do. Thanks again. Um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your Friday and uh, a great weekend. And hope to see you back next Wednesday at 2 o'clock for our look at the NDC. Thank you so much, and thanks again to our panelists.